This short video looks at the hypothesis testing for the mean with the standard deviation, population standard deviation sigma, unknown. Now, in an earlier video, we looked at the case where the population standard deviation is known. When the population standard deviation is known, we use as our test statistic, we will use the normal distribution. We will use z is equal to x bar minus mu sigma over root n. But in the case when it is unknown, this is where the t distribution comes in. The t distribution is necessary because the fact that the population standard deviation is unknown, for typically small samples, there is uncertainty in the estimate of the population standard deviation. So we have a family of distributions that we use called a t distribution. We know the t distributions are symmetrical. They kind of look like a standard normal. But each distribution is associated with a sample size. In other words, the, 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 how wide that distribution is is adjusted according to the sample size. So as the sample size gets larger, the width of that uh, distribution or the spread in the distribution gets smaller and smaller until it becomes a normal distribution. So all we need to do now is to replace our test statistic by this formula right here. So before we use z is equal to x bar minus mu sigma over root n, well now we're going to replace it with, notice the form looks pretty much the same, but instead of sigma, we're going to have s. And then uh, the t value, that sample, that sample of size n means that we'll have a t distribution associated with it, which has degrees of freedom n minus 1. Okay, so we would employ the t distribution. But we need some assumptions. One assumption is that the population is normally distributed. The second assumption is that the sample is randomly chosen. The sample is randomly chosen. And so with those two assumptions, we could go ahead and use the t distribution. The steps are pretty much the same, which is we specify the population parameter of interest, mu, formulate the null and the alternate hypothesis, then specify the, de the desired significance level, construct the rejection region, and then define the decision rule. If it's a one-tailed test, we're simply looking for evidence that the uh, observed t-value is greater than the critical value. If it's a one-tailed test on the left, then we're looking for evidence that the observed t-value is smaller than the critical t-value. And then if it is uh, not equal to, then we're looking for evidence in either direction. We compute the test statistic and find the p-value. It says O, but I usually like to find it anyway. Reach a decision and then the conclusion. So I'll, let me just illustrate uh, for you that essentially we're doing the same analysis as the case where we use the Z statistic, but we just have to know how to find the appropriate T value. So if we had a null hypothesis, the mean is less than or equal to 15, HA, the mean is greater than 15, and we were given some sample standard deviation, I'll say 6, we found some sample mean of 18 or something like that. I'm just, just using this uh, as an arbitrary example. So if, it, if this case is a one-tailed test, look at the evidence. We're looking for evidence that the mean is greater than 15. So we would... This would be our t-distribution this time. And... Uh, critical t value, t critical, will be based on alpha. So let me give you a value for alpha. I'll take 5%. So this would be 0 0.05. And our critical t value would be based on the following. So t critical. So you notice I just added a sample size. I say let's make N25 would be the T value that's associated with 0 0.05 in the tail 
But the degrees of freedom is 24, n minus 1. So we look that up in the table and get what that uh, critical T value is. 0, 0,5 degrees of freedom, 24. So you must recall that the degrees of freedom is n minus 1. In this case, 25 minus 1 gives us 24. Which is 24. Not sure what's happening to my handwriting right now. Oops. Okay, that's not uh, expected. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, we know it's 24. Um, so that's the one tail test. And if we determine our observed value, which is t, 0, if that is greater than the critical value, we'll reject the null hypothesis. All right? In a left tail test, what would happen if we had just a left tail test? Then we'll be looking down here. Our T critical would be a negative value. And so we'll be looking for T0 to be less than, to be in the rejection region. This is the rejection region right here, the shaded region. T0 would have to be less than T critical. And we obtain T critical the same way. This area is alpha. The degrees of freedom is still 24. So we look up alpha degrees of freedom. We find a T value, but its sign would be negative. And then in this case right here, where we have a two-tailed test, this now is alpha over 2, alpha over 2. And our table actually um, gives us... Uh, a very easy way of, of identifying what is the appropriate row because it has one tail, two tail confidence level. In this case, our T critical, we have two critical values, but because the curve is symmetrical, one is just a negative of the other. So we look up the T value associated with alpha over two in the tail, n minus one degrees of freedom. Once we get that T value, then the other value is just a negative of that. So if we find um, sample means that are extreme, that have t-values, observed t-values, that are greater than this critical value here, or less than this critical value, then we will reject the null hypothesis. Anything in between, we fail to reject. Okay? We don't reject if our t-value falls in this range between those two. But on the outside, we're saying that that sample is extreme enough and that we should go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. Now, calculating p-values with the, with the um, one-tail, two-tail test, let me just illustrate that for you. And we will do work examples. So if it turns out, while this is my, say, t-critical value, that my T observe is over here. So this is actually my P value right here. The P value is a probability associated with this sample. The alpha or significance level is what we use to determine the critical value. So you could see how the P, if, if I'm in the rejection region, T0 is beyond T critical. If I'm in that rejection region, the P value naturally is smaller than alpha, which is all of that. It is naturally smaller, because that's the only way I could get into the rejection region, is if that area to the right of T0 is smaller. So in that case, I will compute that p-value, or my observed risk, as the probability of T being greater than or equal to T0. And I would have to go to the table, try to identify T0 for 24 degrees of freedom, and, and find what the area, the closest area is. Uh, you're finding p-values with the T distribution is a little trickier than normal distribution, but the same principle uh, basically applies. Okay? So in a one-tailed test, this is my p-value. The two-tailed test now, 
is a little different. So if I now have two tails where I'm looking for evidence, let's say this were my t value, t observed. We already know I don't need to draw in the alpha part. Um, we already know that this would be the probability of observing that sample. But because it is a two-tailed test, maybe I should draw in. Let me put it in red. So this is my, because the two-tailed test, the, sh the red region is alpha over 2. The red region is alpha over 2. Remember, the two of them must add up to alpha. So my rejection region is here and here. My observed T value is in the rejection region. But, you know, I would have rejected or I would have found the evidence equally strong if it so happened that the T value was the exact opposite, the negative of this, negative T0. In other words, if I had found a sample equally extreme but on the left side, that would also put me in the rejection region. So what happens now is that that p-value for this case of the two-tailed test is not just this. It's this plus this area as well. So in other words, we have to double up on things. So the same way in one tail we have alpha over 2, then in one tail we would have the p-value over 2, half the p-value. All right. So there's the other half right here. And so the p-value for a two-tailed test is usually, is not usually, it is twice the value of one of the um, ex expressions here. So t greater than or equal to t0. Or I could have written it as the probability that t is less than negative t0 um, plus the probability that t is greater than or equal to t0. Well, what's the point? These two are equal, so all I need to do is to find one of them and then just double it, which takes me to this formula right here. And that's how we would find the p-value when we have a two-tailed test. If it is a one-tailed test, then it is just that probability alone. Um, one-tailed test for the left tail is some people get confused, but again, it's the same principles that apply. So if we have our rejection region, and what, let's assume that here's our T observed, this happens to be a negative value. In our rejection region, our T crit critical will be a negative value. So The entire rejection region in this case is alpha, so therefore this entire region here would be our p-value. Oops, let's get rid of that. So this entire region would be our p-value. I'll draw a little arrow right here, P value. Okay? And so P value would be written as the probability of the T value being less than or equal to negative T0. Notice that the same decision will be made whether or not you're comparing T observe to T critical or the P value to alpha we get exactly the same decision because there are just one case we're working in in standard deviations and the other case we're working in probabilities. T is a standard deviation, the number of standard deviations. Then uh, p-value and alpha are just probabilities. But remember that they are related, right? For example, the t-critical is related to alpha and then the p-value is related to t-observed. So you will get exactly the same results. If you get different results uh, um, when you do the p-value approach versus the um, comparing the critical values, then you made a mistake somewhere.
So here is a, an example where a tire company conducted a test on a new tire design to determine whether the company could make the claim that the mean tire mileage would exceed 60,000 miles. A simple random sample of 100 tires was selected and the number of miles each for each tire was recorded. So we found the following information um, that, and, and, and the values are expressed in thousands, you can see. We're going to use a significance level of alpha of 5%. Um, our sample size is 100. Sample mean is 60.17. Sample standard deviation, so we don't know sigma. And the degrees of freedom is n minus 1, which is 99. Our T value, our critical value, because it's a one-tailed test, okay, we want to prove that the mean is greater than 60,000. So we have a one-tailed test, so the entire area is alpha. So 5%, when the T value, sorry, when the area is 5% and the degrees of freedom is 99, we have a critical T value of 1.66, of 1.66, all right? And so all we do is we compute the test statistic here, 60.17, that's a sample mean, minus a population value, which is 60, S over root n, 4.701 over square root of 100, and we get a T value of 0.3616. Well, this is nowhere near 1.664. So we said the sample is extreme if we get 1.664 standard deviations away from the mean. This sample is only 0.36 of a standard deviation from the mean. So it's not far enough. So it's not extreme enough. And therefore, we would not conclude that the average uh, for that tire is greater than 60,000. So here's a case where we're comparing the critical value with the observed value. There's the critical value. We compared with the observed value. But we could go ahead and calculate the p-value associated with this, uh, with this um, sa um, sample. How would we calculate that p-value? It's a one-tailed test, remember? Okay, one tail test. So because this is a one tail test, the p-value, I'm just going to just, I can see my curves are probably no better than yours. Let me do that again. I should be able to do it a little better. I think. And that's better. Yeah. So here we had a critical value of 1.6604. But we got a T value, which is much more than this, 0.3616. I'm going to do that in red. Somewhere around here. 0.3616. I don't have space down in the bottom to do it. So our p-value, if you look at it in red, is much greater than the alpha value in black. So that's why we will not reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is actually greater than alpha. We only reject it when the p-value is less than alpha. All right? To calculate that p-value would be the probability at t is greater than or equal to 0.3616. It turns out we could use Excel. This example here used Excel and it's almost 0.36 actually. And 0.3592. So that's the size of that red area right here, 0.3592, which is quite large where uh, compared to our 0.05. So you could see we're not in the rejection region because we would only reject had we been beyond 1.6604. But we're not quite there yet. And so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the p-value is th if almost 35%. So if you decided, well, you know something, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis anyway, the risk you would be willing to take would be a 36% risk of being wrong. Who wants to take a 36% risk of being wrong?
I don't think I want to do that. So that is why we would not reject the null hypothesis. We would go ahead and say, we have insufficient evidence. We need that risk to come down way down, down to 5% or less before we reject the null hypothesis. And hopefully that, uh, so just to recap, this is a case where we're dealing with the T distribution, the population standard deviation is unknown. Now, I should mention to you, if you look at our sample size, our sample size is actually quite large. N is... 100. So we could apply the central limit theorem which states that as the sample size gets large, the sampling distribution of the sample mean becomes approximately normal. So in this case, we could use z is equal to x bar minus mu s over root n. And that's only because our sample size is large, in which case we would have found a z critical and the z-critical for 5% in the tail is 1.645. Now you notice that because the sample size is large, that 1.645 is not a whole lot different from the 1.66, 1.6604 for the t-value. So you see, by this time, the t-value is approximating or getting very close to the normal distribution. So we could actually, with this problem, Make the assumption that the sampling distribution is approximately normal, apply the central limit theorem, and use a z value for our test statistic. Thank you.